Hi, right, my friends. Everything we've known and forecast when it comes to economics, financial planning, investment returns is not, has been based on economies that, are, oh, look at that guy. Hey, buddy. You can see him. Hello. Nay. Nay. Or hee haw, hee haw. Look at that guy. Just sitting there by his own. You can see Luxury Collection. Berkshire Hathaway is trying to sell that for a, uh, let's take a look. To try to sell 16 and a half acres. You see that? Uh, 12,854 square foot estate home, 16 and a half acres. And you get that, uh, whatever that thing is, a donkey, mini horse, something like that. 12,000 square foot home. For the love of the good Lord, man. Look, if you live in one of those, I don't get it. What is your freaking utility bill? That is nuts. To each his own, of course. To each his own. But man, that's uh, that's just odd to me. All right, anyway, and that house has been on the market for a long time. Because no one wants to live in a 12,000 square foot home other than Tom Friedman, Al Gore, all the green machinists. The green guys, they all live in these huge homes. Al Gore's got, what, 20,000 square foot home? They're generating like 20, or how much, a 10,000 square foot home? Generating 20,000, he, he uh, not generating, uh, consuming 20,000 kilowatt hours a month, I think, something like that. <laughs> Obama, they're not, uh, just the whole thing is funny. I love it. All right, so everything we've known about economic theory, financial markets and all that, is based on a premise that is no longer here. And I just, you know, I'm reading my, my man Richard Koo, K-O-O's book, The Holy Grail of Macroeconomics. And I've stated this book a million times a Sunday to you because I'm a guy who reads, and I'm not as smart as you. I need to put it down and think about it for a little bit. And then I research it, which is why, I, you know, to be perfectly honest, the books on audio are harder for me I get a lot out of it, but I don't get nearly as much as actually reading it, highlighting it, and looking at some of the uh, uh, things they, they link to, um, the attributions and whatnot. Anyway, did you know, I did not know this, again, Jimmy Carter, man, <laughs> the guy's a free market, who knew, other than being anti-Jew, he's a free market guy, more than hell freaking George H.W. Bush, certainly more than Richard Nixon. Probably more than Gerald Ford was. Anyway, so Carter signed legislation, 1979-1980, called the Monetary Control Act, which basically allowed currencies to exchange freely, a free flow of capital to and from the U.S., allowed banks to charge market interest rates and to offer market interest rates to depositors and debtors as well before that was all fixed margaret thatcher did the same in 1979 in the uk and the japan did the same a few years later what that meant is before there's a fixed exchange rate based on whatever the, the country chose all right so if you have 100 countries out there each choosing a fixed exchange rate and let's say some like venezuela are pushing down the exchange rate because they want to prop up their own dollar whatever the, the bolivar bolivar whatever it is it doesn't matter the country if they're creating a fake exchange rate that's not market forces all they're doing is pushing more and more goods and services into the black market and because of that, you got more scarcity and higher inflation. So that's what happens when you have a fixed exchange rate that can be corrupted by government. So Margaret Thatcher, because she freaking king of the world, Reagan, uh, actually Jimmy Carter, Japan, yeah, everyone now. I said, all right, we're going to allow the free flow of capital. And what that does is it means interest rate policy now is no longer solely uh if you're in a foreign country it's completely dependent on all these other countries as well 
And that was one of the factors of the Euro, the European Union, you know, combining. It's because, say, we're going to have one currency, so that way one country can't manipulate it. It'll be manipulated by Brussels, the ECB, European Central Bank. And everyone will fall for that, which is good. It'll make everything free flow of trade, goods, people, you know, free flowing. It'll make it, uh, it'll be more prosperous because it'll be more efficient. And even my man, Richard Koo, argues in this book, and again, he had written it, published in 2009, but written in 2007, that this would be greatly improving the EU economy with a euro, the European Central Bank, and the EU. But he was wrong. Because each of those countries have their own... Greece is different than Germany, believe it or not. Completely different moral ground, completely different thought process, different language, different way to do things. Now, they're all human beings, 99.999% similar DNA-wise, but they all have different patterns of how to get along and do things. Greece is notorious for corruption. So just going to the EU did not remove that corruption at all. In fact, if anything, it allowed it to continue because they're getting the benefit of attaching their flag to the, uh, the euro. But at some point, that has got to, which it is, I mean, it's, the, uh, the situation has got to be dealt with. You can only kick it down the road so much. So right now, in fact, for the last, what, 10 years, a bunch of basket cases over there. But because Greece is tied to the same currency as Germany, <laughs> Greece can't do what it needs to do to essentially devalue their currency to have more jobs at hand because they're attached to Germany. And they're two completely different economies. Not just from a strength population perspective, but just the way they do business. So Greece now has, has literally relinquished its ability to manage its affairs on the monetary system. 100%. And yet their people still vote for local officials, right? This is why the whole Brexit thing makes so much sense when you think about it. Because the EU is telling Greece what to do with their money. And Greece says, yeah, we've got the benefit of being attached to Germany, but now we're getting punished for being attached to Germany because of uh, what you got to do in terms of ramping down spending, you know, ramping down debt, all that stuff. Keeping our currency, which is a euro, as uh, as highly valued as what Germany is offering, but yet we can't compete on a global scale with the U.S., never mind the uh, Southeast Asian company, countries. It's nuts. So the point about this, all this talk about previous rates of return, uh, don't forget, you could not even own gold in the U.S. until, what, 1974. It was illegal from 1932, I think, to 1974, to own gold. We had a fixed currency, we had fixed commissions, we had a fixed interest rate. I, I, we had uh, monopolistic trucking, airplane, I mean the whole thing. It's a completely different country now. It's a completely different world. It's a completely different economy. Anyway, so reading my man Richard Koo's book, I'm sitting there thinking, because, and he talks about because the free flow of currency and capital, how a, a homeowner in Greece could borrow in Japanese yen because it's so cheap relative to the euro and then buy a home in Greece and pay it back in Japanese yen, essentially the arbitrage there is through the roof because the Japanese yen back when he's writing this was so cheap relative to the euro. That essentially is borrowing it. It has a Japanese yen depreciated. This homeowner in Greece was getting benefits because inflation helps debtors. I know it's tough to put your head around, and I don't need to give you the basic economic theory on this to make you an economist, but inflation helps those in debt. It hurts those who lend. It helps the borrowers. It hurts the lenders. So again, you're in Greece, you want to buy a house. Free flow of capital across the world. Easy to do now. You say, I'm going to borrow in Japanese yen. Now, how mechanically that happens, I don't know. But you say, I'm going to borrow in Japanese yen, and I'm going to go buy that house in euros, 100,000 euros. I'm going to buy a house in Greece in 100,000 bucks. But I borrowed 
$500,000 of Japanese yen, all right, which is the equivalent of 100,000 euros. A year later, that Japanese yen fell from five to one to 10 to one. So now I have a depreciation of the, uh, the debt I owe Japan by 50%. So now the real cost of my debt to Japan is 50,000, essentially, because I borrowed 100,000, but the Japanese yen is now worth a half of what it was. I'm still getting paid in euros though. So now my euro buys twice as much as what it did before. But I was able to buy that house for 100,000 bucks. It doesn't matter because the house is in Greece. My income is in euro, but my debt is in yen. New Zealand, a perfect example is what Richard Koo talks about. Why is it but housing is so expensive in New Zealand and Australia? Same scenario. People are able to buy, to borrow in an economy with a currency that's being devalued in front of their very eyes. You could think about Venezuela. Now, again, exchange controls of Venezuela is tough because it's all done in the black market, which creates scarcity. And you don't want to do that. But, you know, you go to Thailand, just use that for an example. I would have no clue what the Thai currency is or what its value is relative to whatever the New Zealand currency is. But it's the same premise. The Thailand currency is less and we'll say it trades at 10 to 1 compared to New Zealand. I buy a house in New Zealand. I borrow in Thai. The Thai currency, they deflate it or inflate it, devalue it, because they want to increase exports. I'm still getting paid in New Zealand dollars. My house is still the same house. I just owe less when it comes to real value because I'm getting paid in dollar bills that are worth more than what they were when they borrowed simply because the Thai inherently devalue the currency to increase exports. <laughs> now, before the free capital flows, you couldn't do that. And so the real estate market was, was based on whatever the local dollar was at that time. Local dollar was one to one, whatever it was, didn't matter. But because you couldn't borrow in foreign currencies to buy a piece of real estate in local currency, you, you had no way to arbitrage that. And so the real estate markets, and because they had fixed interest rates as well, and banks were competing on interest, you couldn't hedge that. There's no comp.